Uh, my name is Nick Larson, and we're going to get back started on what we have been working on, which is just hanging out and doing a little bit of search problems with a little, you know, a little AI trying to solve some problems. And uh, that's it. Let's go ahead and sort of get to it, catch up with where we left off last time. Uh, actually, I don't even need this because we got a to-dos now. That's right. In here. All right, on our to-do list is uh, this. Should we should put a little date over here? Uh, what is one two thousand two thousand nineteen oh one thirty? That's cool. Yeah, that's how I want to do that. I think. All good. Okay, hooray. And then let's do whatever we're gonna do today. Improve the nodes explored. This is oh, pie in the sky stuff. Implement the to-dos, fix test. All right, this is, this is the main problem that we ran into last time, which is the, um, the test base, the open set test. This open set test is failing. And what it does is it basically adds a bunch of stuff to our open set. Now, again, a set, the thing that like sets a set aside, makes it different, is that a set uh, should only have each value one time. So these over here are the values. And then this is the, 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 first, the first number is the cost. And then the second number is the value. And that is... Um, sort of what we need to improve here is that whenever we, all right, so what's happening is uh, it builds this tree and then when it's, when you ask it to remove an item or to look for an item a very by, by this second one, by this ID, um, what it does is it will only traverse down whatever side of the tree it thinks the thing is going to be on. Um, and then if it goes down the wrong side, it'll just be happy to add another item to it. So what this does is it pushes 10, then it pushes 20, then it pushes 30. And what we end up with, in fact, we should even make this four to guarantee that this is the root and then try it again. No, it passed that time. Hilarious. Okay, so when all the things are the same size, what it ends up doing is creating a balanced binary tree, and you end up with a score of five on the left and a score of five on the right. And it doesn't know which side to go look down in order to find the thing that it's looking for. So instead, what it does is uh, goes down the one side that it thinks it's on, and then it doesn't find it, so it, it moves on. And that's it. And I think we need to basically test this a bunch of different ways. So same after three, same value. And then after this one, we're going to do after seven, same value. And the idea here just being that we're going to have a lot more items in here. So 40, 50, 60, 70. All right, and this will create a three level binary tree that is completely full. And then I just wanna add in all of these again. And what we ought to end up with, if we switch them all to six now, All right, what we should end up with is a set that has just this many items on it. Um, and so that's what we wanna check. And in fact, I think we ought to reorganize these a little bit to just randomize the order. So let's take this 60. And then let's take this 30 and put it at the end. Now let's try it like this. Six, six everywhere, 
And then we want to say, no, seven items. And let's try this one. This one we know is going to fail, but it's a little more of a robust test because it has a lot more items and they're added in a totally different order. So you can see that we end up with 12 items in this one. Now let's take a look at this one, which, uh, let's go, um, let's go ahead and change the order on these. And then let's change the order on these. Right, it doesn't matter what order we add them in, it should still give us the same thing. Run the test. Okay, and we're still getting the failure here, perfect. Okay, so now uh, I have one quick hack in mind for fixing this, and then if that doesn't work robustly, then what we're going to end up doing is essentially going and taking a look at um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at trying to get basically implement our own version of the set instead of using a built-in collection and see if we can solve it like that so let's go to the open set and in this one we're looking for the magic compare so this magic compare was comparing the score and now what I really want to do is I just want to change this say var compared uh, and then I want to say if compared equals zero which means that they had the same cost in that case, in, in, okay, in the case that there's zero, instead what I want to do is basically return x.state.getHashCode.compare to y.state.get get hash code okay so we know that the hash codes are not equal already uh, and we know they're not equal because if they were equal we would have said that they were the same exact item so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare them and we're gonna say oh if they have the same cost if they have the same cost then what I want to do is uh, compare the hash codes and return the lesser hash code as less than or the greater hash code as greater than. Otherwise, just return negative one or positive one based on whatever the compare to output was. And in fact, I think here we can just return compared because I don't care. So only in the case that compare to was the same. All right. So let's go, let's make this a little, okay. All right, let's, um, let's give these tests a go one more time. And I'm really just kind of crossing my fingers that this works because it would save us a lot of work and we could actually do some interesting stuff today and it did not work, not one bit. Does this still return 12? Yes, it does. Let's go with less than or equal to. That was another another little problem that we had run into. Return. No, because we know that they're not the same. OK. Okay, that's really frustrating. All right, so we're gonna have to implement our own open set not using the magic that's in here. And there's a lot of different ways to do that, but I think the 
one that I want to use. I think we're going to go back to using a heap. And then we're just going to change the way that the heap works. Is this something we even need to worry about? Why on earth do we need to worry about this? The state, what if we didn't store? What if, so I need a way when I'm adding something to this to know if it's already in the open set and then change the value of it. Okay, so that's great. That's great. Let's go, let's just take a look at the reference source and see if there's just something blatantly obvious that we're missing. Reference source of sorted set. If you're not familiar, uh, all of the code for .NET is posted, and you can just go look at the source code. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at reference source, although I guess I should be looking at uh, .NET Core. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, GitHub.com slash micros, no, .NET, .NET, and I don't want Core CLR, I want uh, Core FX. Okay, then we want the source, and then we want systems.collections. System.collections. Oh, what happened to generic? That's interesting. System. Ah, oh, generic, there we go. Okay, and we have sorted set. What is a sorted set of quality compare? Hey. I compare. I equality compare. That's kind of cool. Sorted set equality compare. This is an I. Uh, well, that doesn't seem like what we want. I am sort of curious what this is about. But it doesn't appear to be helpful. So instead, let's go take a look at sorted set, which is what we wanted to look at. Okay. The basic idea of a red-black tree, okay, so it reorganizes itself so we have no idea what item it's going to be or what side it's going to be on. So a red-black tree is basically a self-balancing binary tree, which keeps it super dense. Of course, the only problem is we're not going to be able to easily find the item that we want. That's just really frustrating. Sorted set, collection, sorted set, remove all elements, add all elements, contains all elements, in order tree walk, which I have no access to, breadth first tree walk, interesting, count, compare, Collection read only false. Add. Add if not present. Item. Add if not present. I wonder why they do this pattern right here instead of just like calling this directly. Hack so the implementation can be made virtual. I guess that's your answer. Okay, so now we're saying add, add if not present. If the root is null, then just add a new one. Okay, great. 
search for a node at bottom to insert the new node. If we can guarantee the node we found is not a four node, it would be easy to do insertion. We split four nodes along the search path. Even if we don't actually add to the set, we may be altering its structure by doing rotations and such. So update the version to disable any instances of a numerator tree subset from working on it, okay? In order. Um, order equals zero. While current not equals null. What does current equal? current. I don't see current. Current equals root. All right. Compare. If it's zero, we could have changed the root node by to red during the search process. We need to set it back to black before we return. If it's a four node, split it great-grandparent, grandparent. If order, uh, so it wants to put the order in there. Okay. <clears throat> um, I really don't know. I think I think probably the best thing for us to do I think probably the best thing for us to do is to implement this ourselves. How would we go about doing that? Well, clearly if we had a dictionary the dictionary the dictionary could point to all right well then we could if we had a dictionary we could easily identify set membership what does the dictionary point to it needs to point to the score and then it needs to point to the parent. How do I get all of the things? How do I get the children? So if I have a left child and a right child, all right, let's think about this. I have a dictionary that is the key, which is the state, and then the value needs to be the score and maintain some sort of tree structure so that I can just modify the values of the state, the values of the dictionary in order to get what I'm looking for. I don't know how to do that off the top of my head. What if we had a dictionary? What if we had a dictionary? The values, what if the values were indexes into a heap, an array based heap? That could work. Although every time we do a swap, we'd have to update two values in the dictionary. I guess that's constant time. It's just kind of a lot of overhead. Actually, we only have to update one. And that is the one that got moved because we know the value of the item that we are adding or removing. And so we only have to update that one one time at the very end when it finds its final resting place. 
This seems pretty convoluted. I'm not entirely sure that this is the direction that I would want to go. But none of these sets seem to be doing what I want. Generic sorted sorted dictionary. Key collection, value collection, tree set, key value pair. Tree set. Key value pair comparer. Tree set? What is tree set? Twenty-two instances of it here. Set tree set. Most of them are in initialization logic. Remove. Why they don't just use var here is sort of beyond me. I guess it's just old code copied and pasted or something. Ooh, tree set. Tree set. What if I just had What if I just had two No, I can't because um it's key collection Uh let's do Let's do a little hack, I guess. Let's just add a little test real fast. Uh, open set test. What if we just had fact uh, public void one off test? And this one is uh, var set equals new sorted. Dictionary uh, int int and I want to include whatever it is that I need to include. What does this one allow me to do? I compare. Let's do int double. Okay, I compare That's how you initialize it. Okay, what is the compare? Implementation to use when comparing keys or null to use the Default system dot collections dot generic dot compare for the type of key initializes a new instance. Okay, so the key sorted dictionary. I just don't feel like this is going to do what we want either. This one's kind of kind of frustrating. Key comparer. Hmm. I don't know. This is a good place to google, right? Uh, a star open set implementation. Open set. 
Yeah, that's the book that I'm reading. I'm literally reading that book right now. Heuristic search, theory and applications. Okay, in the following, I'm describing a plain open list. The first alternate consists simply of using a list which sorts nodes in ascending order of their f value. This doesn't really help using sets. A star might additionally require to perform searches in the open list. Strictly speaking, this is not required and the only purpose for doing it is to save some memory, which anyway will grow exponentially. Note please that this will not avoid redundant expansions as the closed list already serves specifically to that purpose. In a nutshell, before the expansion of any node, verify it is not in the closed list. If so, skip the current expansion, otherwise expand it and insert it into closed. Okay. So maybe this is just saying that it's not a problem at all. Uh, a star Wikipedia. Yeah, if it's in the closed set, so you remove it. If the neighbor is not in the open set. Yeah, well, that's what I'm talking about. So for each neighbor of current, if it's not in the closed set, then we'll expand it. If the neighbor is not in the open set, then we add it to the open set, but it is in the open set. If tentative score, if open set, how do you get the min? Yeah, like how do you do this step efficiently and this step efficiently? I want to have an open set having the lowest F score value. I guess, I guess the order doesn't matter. And what we do is we create score score to items. This works great for like integers with small ranges, but once you get into very large ranges, this sort of open set implementation is no longer going to work. So the idea is that your key is your sort value. Right. Your key is your sort value. Your cost is your sort value. But you got to be able to look and see if the neighbor is how about how about it's okay 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 so we just have a hash set that tells you whether or not the item is in there at all. I need, I need some way to be able to remove it. Yeah, I'm right back to this, like, tell me where it's at problem. I want... I feel like I'm, like, stuck in a rut and thinking the same thing over and over and over. 
I'm trying to change the way that I'm thinking about it to say that the F score F score map with a default. Like, I really don't understand this. I don't understand this because if you have an F score, how do you get the min F score quickly? This doesn't seem like none of these. You can now implement neighbor not in open set. The problem is if it is in the open set, I'm not guaranteed that the path I have taken to get it into the open set is optimal. So I feel like maybe the maybe the answer here is just that you have to you have to let it in there and that this sort of formulation is kind of crappy. If the neighbor is not in the open set Oh, I see. So it doesn't give you an idea about how to do this, but this is actually quite trivial because it's just a dictionary of value to score. It's just a dictionary of value to score. just a dictionary of value to score. Is that super useful? A dictionary, you know what, I really want to write on the board. A dictionary of value to score. How do you get the node in the open set having the lowest F score value? So you need to sort by the value, but you need to index by the state. Okay. Let's try a new one of these. Okay, let's try a new one of these. Um. Yeah, let's try a new one of these. And the way that we want to do it is we want to say open set one, open, open set one. Like open set one. All right, we want a dictionary of t state to t cost. That's yeah, I think that's I think that's what we want. And then I think we want um, state cost. Yeah. And I think we want another dictionary of T cost, a sorted dictionary of T cost T 
to hash set of t state. And this is going to be cost states. Okay, so now we're just going to have um, state cost equals new. And then we're going to have um, cost states equals new. Yeah, I think that's I think that's all we want there. Then we want to implement this jazz. Uh, I do think we want all of this because that is all useful. Mm. And we want uh, state cost. And then we want cost states. Dot first using system dot link. Okay. No, first dot key. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I think there's just going to be a little bit more overhead about like maintaining this thing as we go. So let's go ahead and get these pusher improve and pop men. Like I said, okay, I think, I think what we're going to do here is sort of the same only, yeah, like I said, there's a little bit more overhead to it. So what we want to do is Clear this out. I'm not super concerned with this. Throw a new not implemented exception just so I can get something good. Okay. To pop, let's do pop men because that one's easier. So what we say is um, cost states. All right, if size equals zero, throw new invalid operation exception. Yeah, let's just copy that actually, because that one was, if is empty, even better. Okay, if is empty, otherwise what we want to do is get the top so i want to say var min cost states equals uh cost states dot first And then we want to say var state equals um, min cost states dot first. And then what we want to say is return state min cost states of dot value. value and then what we want to say is min cost states dot remove state and uh, state cost dot remove state okay so what this does is 
Oh. Min cost states dot remove. Okay. If min cost states dot count equals zero, then we want cost states dot remove of uh, min cost. Let's just call it min because it's getting out of control. And I don't want that. I want the whole thing. I want min. I want min dot value dot first. Min dot value dot remove. Uh, yeah. States min states uh, var state equals min states now um, min states min states dot count equals zero then cost states dot remove min dot key okay let's take a hey what's up good to see you rambling geek how are things going man uh just to catch you up i'm doing like a little bit of ai i'm got this problem going right now where uh i have to implement an open set and this open set has this property that you have a state and you have a cost and the state is there. Uh, see if I can explain this a little bit better. Awesome, man, that's awesome. Are you at work right now? Or are you just like, are you at home? I guess you're in, what is it? Like 4.30, 4.45 there? Five o'clock, I don't know. How far off are you? Um, but anyway, I have, uh, I have this basically a set, but it has this magic property that it has to be a sorted set only we need to not sort on the key, we need to sort on the value. Oh, you're at work still, okay, that's cool. Where do you work, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? And uh, all of the internal implementations that I have found in .NET will only sort on the key. And that is not what we want. We need set membership to be decided based on the key and then we need multiple sort values to be allowed. So what I'm doing now is basically implementing um, my own collection here that, that does it. Small IT support company in Chester. CNS IT, that's cool. I forget exactly, so what, what part of everything do you do? Do you like manage servers or are you like, I don't know, what do you do? Is it is it like, keeping the network online for the office or is it like you know managing yeah managing servers or cloud or small IT support company I guess you're su supporting other companies I don't know taking a look at it CNS IT yeah we support networks for other companies that's cool. U Texas CNS IT Chester. There it is. That's cool. Okay. Um, well, thanks for joining the stream, man. Are you interested in this sort of thing? like a little bit of AI, a little bit of what's what's going on. I'm currently working, like I said, on uh, re-implementing the way that site needs updating. Oh, I got you, that's cool. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, so basically uh, 
implementing a star, but I ran into this problem and I wrote a little test where the open set, uh, a set should of course only allow the same value in there one time. And so if I try to add the same values multiple times, um, but I put a higher value in there, it should just throw the other ones away. And instead what's happening is it's coming through it and when it, there should be seven items in there because there's only seven actual keys or values rather, um, it's somehow managing to put 12 in here. So, so that's kind of the problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, and again, what I've been able to like figure out so far is that the, the implementations in, um, like in the .NET framework for all of the sorted collections sort based on the key, even the ones that are set based like sorted set and, um, What's the other one here? Sorted set and sorted dictionary. And what ends up happening is you insert the the value, you know, the, the cost of a node in your search tree. And it wants to sort based on those, but it's using that same sort sorting value, the cost, as the like set value, the state value. And that's that's not right. So what I'm doing instead what I am doing instead, I know that's not really the greatest, you know, explanation. So if you can think of, uh, or not think of anything, but if, uh, if it didn't make sense, if you want me to like try a little harder, I'm more than happy to. What's the AI's job? So, oh, that's a great question. Let's take a look. Uh, so I'm solving a problem called the N puzzle problem, and we're just going to search for eight puzzle. Um, have you ever seen, I don't want one of these. I want a big picture. There we go, like this. Okay, so you have the, it's sometimes called the sliding tile puzzle. Um, and what it does is you have a blank spot and then you move anything that's adjacent to it into the blank spot. And of course the blank spot moves. So if you move the five, okay, so you've seen these, great. So the idea is we want to write some AI that can solve these optimally and do it efficiently, like very efficiently. So what I've managed to do so far is a couple of tests, which are all currently broken, but we're, they're not broken. They're just, they're not as, as efficient as they should be. So this right here, and as few moves as possible, that's correct. Uh, so for this eight puzzle pop problem, uh, the, the hardest problem in all of it takes 31 steps in order to solve it. And so I wrote first a breadth first search solver. And if we run this, you can see that it's gonna actually find the solution. It's just gonna take it a little bit. All right, so what we did is it found the solution. It did find that it was 31 moves and it returned it to the, you know, the goal position where it's starting at one then two then three and then the blank is the zero. So the blank is in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and it, it found it, it found it in the right time. The trick is, um, look at that, it did it exactly. You know why? Because I changed the open set implementation. Let me change this back to what it was earlier. Uh, Return compared less than or equal to zero, negative one or ones. Okay, so this is what it was, you know, when we started today. Uh, and let's just try that one more time so you can actually see like the problem that we're trying to solve. A solver test, run test. So did you have to train it? No, that's uh that's one of the great things about A star. You don't train it at all. Man, this is incredible. I can't seem. Oh, I did the hamming distance this time. No wonder. We want the breadth for a search. Okay. Uh, no, you don't train it. The way that it works is you just describe the rules of the world, and then it takes the first node, whatever your starting position is. It and treats that as a state. So the state that we're starting with is the top row is eight, six, seven, the second row is two, five, four, then you have 301 on the bottom row. This is our starting state in the sliding puzzle where the zero again is the blank and it starts out on the bottom in the middle. And then what it does is it says, okay, give me all of the possible actions that I can take from this state 
which is to move the five there, to move the three there, or to move the one there. Um, and then it creates those as you know neighbors and it adds those to a giant open set. And then we go through that set and we say, give me the next thing off the set. And then we do the exact same thing. We say, is this a goal state? If no, then, well, if yes, then hey, hooray, and return you know the solution. If no, uh, go back in there. Uh, what like an array exactly? The open set or like the representation of the state? The, uh, the feedback loop on the speed here. I'm something I'm gonna have to work on. Uh, the state. Yeah, so the state in this case, um, you can implement it as an array. This is a great point. Okay, so I have this like to-do list here and on the to-do list, we have this thing called improve the nodes explored per second by orders of magnitude. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the state representation, which is here in InPuzzle. The way that I am doing it is I am treating it as just a U long. So a U long is 64 bits. And because the, the uh, maximum value that you can have is um, nine, right? There's, there's nine cells. Uh, so there's the blank and then the one through the eight you need four bits in order to represent that. So I'm saying, okay, every single four bits of this 64 bit thing is going to represent one of the tiles. So the lowest one represents the top right hand, I'm sorry, the top left hand corner. And then the, the next four bits higher than that represent the next one. And then the next four bits than that represent the third one. And then the next four bits go to the next row. And that's what value bits is here. And then you basically take this magic equation and this is how you figure out the value of any particular tile. Um, the reason I am storing it in just a single U long instead of having something like a, an array here is because you have to create a copy of these states every time you make a move. You, you can't just you know modify this board and then that's that because the next time you need to come to use this board you might be in a totally different state. Um, so you can't just have one instance of the state going around. You have to create a full copy of it. And when you have an array and you're copying an entire array, uh, that becomes very expensive. And so, so the problem is, so is the problem fixed? If the numbers are in a different order than you had listed, would it still be able to solve it? Absolutely. Um, and it is, it is effectively solving every problem that it finds along the way. So give me um, any representation here open state test, solver test. And what we can do is just say uh, string initial state equals initial state. And then let's just change these up, right? Let's put, uh, let's put a three here, a one here, a six here. And what was it a four? Yeah, so this is a totally different state, right? And what we can do is we can find the solution to this one as well. I don't know what the actual like, magic value of this one is supposed to be. But since this is solving it optimally, it's going to just spit out and tell us what the answer is. So the answer is 25 moves because we know that this implementation is correct. It says it failed, but that's because I didn't put in a real value. We could go and look up a couple of um, eight puzzles, eight puzzle optimal move counts. Normally you don't find eight puzzles anywhere in, anywhere in like literature because what ends up happening, let's see here, the goal initial hamming is five manhattan is 10 I really wanted to tell me what give me a starting state and then tell me what an answer this one is quite large so we don't want that one inversions four 
this is just describing how you can tell whether it's not you need an animation showing how it's solved oh that is such a great idea man that is a great idea i'm gonna put that on this to do actually animation showing how to solve it yeah so it does in a sense have that ability right here we would just say like uh, output dot right line of puzzle dot two string and then let's put in a little break and say move of dollar sign move of i and then let's put the actual move in there move and then if we run this again we ought to be able to see it i mean half joking yeah but like the visual representation of saying things work is like so cool it's also makes it makes it a lot easier to to understand what's going on. And you can see here that that's what's happening, right? It tells us the first thing we wanna do is we wanna to move to index one, one. So we moved it up and then we move it to the right and then we move the blank down and then we move the blank to the left. You understand how, how that's working in there? It tells you the, the coordinates of where to move to, where to move the blank to next. Um, and yeah, like, Honestly, like having a, a visual representation of it would would make this a, a little bit better. So really, uh, I guess I guess I should record the last move and then just like say you know up left down right. Yeah, right. So this game isn't particularly interesting. Um, the way that you calculate the total number of states here is there are nine cells. Have them enter the numbers in the site and see if you have to solve. So, all right, a couple of things here. You're, you've gone over quite a bit. Um, there are not that many states to this game. Um, there are nine tiles and they can be in any order, so nine factorial. And then it turns out that only half of the states are solvable. So you divide by two. And this is really the only number of like reachable states that you have in this game at all. But... What does get interesting is when you start ramping this game up, right? Let's say instead of a three by three, we do a four by four. Now you have 16 factorial possible states. And again, half of them are not reachable, but that is still what um, tens, thousands, millions, billions, 10 trillion, 10 and a half trillion possible states in the, in the four by four puzzle. So you can see like, how insanely more difficult this problem gets by just increasing the size by a little bit. Now, the interesting thing here is humans can solve this no problem, right? We can sit down and we can just move the tiles around and eventually we'll get everything to sort of where it goes. Um, but humans aren't solving it optimally. And the goal of this thing is to find the optimal solution. So really the like long-term goal of what I'm trying to do here is not to solve this, this in puzzle problem. Um, what it is is to show that although there's 10 trillion states here, we're still gonna be able to solve this optimally in like five milliseconds. Um, because what we're gonna do is we're going to learn heuristics. In fact, I'll just give you the heuristics talk again since you're here. I did a little discussion on this yesterday, but this is sort of um, the way that heuristics work. So in in the land of A star, so in, okay, let me start over. In breadth first search, every single time you move from one state to the next state, you just consider the cost increased by one. Right, So you have to try every single possible state uh, because you always choose the lowest cost move before you expand any higher cost move. And because it has no idea about where the goal is, you have to expand every single possible path that is shorter than the path to the goal before you can ever get to the goal. Um, and to give you like a visual representation of what that looks like, let's do something like this. Let's say this right here 
is your start state and this right here is your goal state. So what, in, what ends up happening is you have uh, your breadth first search, you know, searches one move out, then it searches two moves out, then it searches three moves out, then four moves out, and imagine that these are concentric. I'm just hand drawing it. Then five moves out, then six moves out, and then on your seventh one, boom, you finally find the answer, right? So you had to expand all of this area in order to find this thing that's you know only seven moves away. You had to try every single possible path of seven or less away from me, away from your starting state. Uh, the difference between like a breadth first search and an A star search is that A star guesses how far away it is from the goal and then uses that to direct the search. So the idea is like, I'm right here. Imagine, imagine this is a map on like Google Maps, right? Let's, uh, let's just take a look at Google Maps. Maps.google.com. And let's zoom out to something like... I live in Roanoke, in case anybody's not, not aware. Uh, something really, really, really bold like this, right? And then let's take a little screenshot here. Boom. Okay, and then let's go and paste it in here. So let's say we are starting in Nashville, right here. And we want to get to Baltimore, right? So the idea is that a breadth first search is going to consider every one of these little intersections a, a node that it has to evaluate, right? And then what we're trying to do is we're eventually trying to get to here. So we'll do breadth first search in blue. And breadth first search is first going to say, okay, I can go here. 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 And I can go all the way to here, right? These are my options. And then it says, okay, now let me try all the places that are two moves away. So it says, okay, I can go here, I can go here, I can go here, I can go here, 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 and here. And then it says, okay, now let me try all the places that are three intersections away. So it says here and here, and then we finally got to Chattanooga on that one. And then we got to Huntsville on that one. And then we got to Birmingham. And I think you can kind of understand what we're going for here is that it sort of expands out in all directions. And and that's what it's uh, attempting to do. Shift win S to snip. Oh, shift win S. Ah, slick. Yeah, I always put that down in my bar. I had no idea that was a hot key. Thanks a lot for that. I really appreciate that. Um. So open shortest path first. Yeah, basically exactly the shortest path, but the shortest path is determined not by the distance of the road that's traveled, but the number of intersections that you have like expanded through, right? There, there is no concept of cost yet. When you move, when you move to the next uh, type of search, it's called greedy best first. Mm -hmm. And that takes into a cost that is not a unit cost. So the difference between breadth first search and greedy first is just that the, there is a cost of one guaranteed or there is a variable cost. And in the case that there's a variable cost, you would expand the shortest ones first and then you would expand the longer ones next. But you would still expand in the same direction because it has no idea where the goal is. So it's not trying to actually make progress towards the goal. It's still just like, let me test the next ones. Just like this, Evansville. Now we can go here, we can go here. And then it's like, I can do all this thing. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that, but we were already in Birmingham. So now it's like this and this and that. And then this is like, oh, I'll come over here. This is like, I'll come over here. But you can see again, like the whole point though, is that it's expanding in a giant circle around the starting point as opposed to making progress toward the goal. So the difference now is A star, where in A star you predict how far away you are from the goal, and then you always choose the shortest path based on your prediction of how far you are away from the goal plus your actual path cost, right? 
on a map, a very common way to do this is to take straight line distance. So let me just add a little layer here. Um, so let's do the way that this would expand is you would still make all the same first moves. But now when it adds the cost in, uh, it now is additionally adding in something that looks sort of like, we'll just do red for this. It says, okay, this green cost plus this straight line distance from here to here, this straight line distance from here to here, this straight line distance, Right, so it's taking the length of the green, the actual cost, plus this guess of how far away it is from the goal. And now what you end up with is things like this, where because we moved away from the goal, it now thinks that going this direction is not helpful because it adds in this additional cost of finding its way back Um to the thing. And so by the time you get out here, like you've gone this far and now you have to add this back in, you can see that that's never going to actually like never going to be shorter than constantly expanding this green one, which will always get a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer. Um, and because that it, it moves in the direction of the goal. So what it ends up doing is taking, you know, making circles that are no longer concentric, but it starts moving in directions like this. And then it's like, you know what, let me expand a little bit here and then expand a little bit here. But you can see that the area that it ends up, like all of the roads that it ends up exploring, don't include all of this crap out here, which isn't actually useful and it's not really going to end up being on the best path. So you end up using far fewer like state evaluations in order to reach your goal. And so the goal here is or the, the idea of using a heuristic is to get as close as possible to guessing the actual distance you are away from the goal. Because if you can guess it exactly, that's called a perfect heuristic. And a perfect heuristic will only ever expand nodes that are on the goal path. Um, and that is a very linear number. Like that will never end up being very large at all. So even if you had like the entire United States and every single intersection in the United States, you can get directions instantly because the heuristic is so good that it will always be making the correct choice about which way to go next. Um, and so that's that's the idea. And what, I, what I'm hoping to accomplish right now is really just to get some of this stuff um, implemented in C-sharp so that you can actually see it. And then let me turn this off again and I'll show you like the effect that having a better heuristic has. Let me just comment these out. All right, so if we do all of the tests, you're gonna see that it's gonna run three tests. And then I'm gonna show you that like, as we use better and better heuristics, it ends up getting enormously better. All right, so the first one Oh, I want to go back to the, the correct state here. Run that one more time. All right. Once this finishes running. Okay. So what we see is that they all found in 31 moves. However, this had to evaluate 470, a uh, breadth first search had to evaluate 475,000 states in order to find the goal. As soon as we used a star with a thing called the hamming distance, and what the hamming distance is, is it counts the number of tiles that are not in the correct place, right? Um, and so you have a maximum value of your hamming distance of eight because there are eight tiles, you don't count the blank. Um, and so it can take your total cost and then it can add as much as eight to it to say that I know I'm each one of these tiles has to move at least one time. So I know that there is at least eight more steps in order to reach the goal. And that's the idea is like you want to guess how far you are away from the goal. Uh, the next thing about it, the next one, oh, and that takes only 178,000 state evaluation. So you can see that that's already like enormously better than 
just doing like the breadth first search that has no idea about where the goal is. And then when we use something called the Manhattan distance, the Manhattan distance is, um, it counts, it does a, a little bit better job of counting the total number of steps that a thing is away. So we know that the eight right, right here needs to end up, you know, down here in the bottom. So it needs to move to the right one and then it needs to move down one and then it needs to move down one. So for this tile, we actually count a value of three. And then we do the same thing for all of the other tiles. The six needs to move down and to the right. So that adds two more, so that's five. The seven needs to move over two and down two. So that adds four and we're up to nine. The two needs to move up one and over one. So we're at 11. And you get the idea. You do this to all of them and it turns out that the, the value of this ends up being like 21, I think. Um, and so it's it's telling you that even though we haven't moved at all, we know there's at least 21 moves. Um, and that actually turns out to be pretty close to the goal, to the real value. Um, and you can see that the total number of states that it has to evaluate drops off like crazy. Um, the better this gets, the fewer number of states you have to get. And if we had a perfect heuristic, it would only ever expand 30 some odd nodes, right? whatever whatever the goal length is that's the number of nodes that it would expand and it would always do it correctly and it would always do it on the first try um and that's why that's what we're trying to do now we're not trying to do the you know this this problem per se the the real goal here is to do something that i'm nodding but you can't see me <laughs> yeah uh, i hope all that makes sense yeah um so right now uh, do notice that, you know, this breadth first search is searching through 475,000 states, but we already showed that there's only um, 9 factorial divided by 2. There's only 180,000 states, um, like, total. Uh, no, this is not Azure AI. This is this is just me writing it. Um, and I, in fact, you can go and you can uh, mess around with the code yourself if you want to. I, I put it up on GitHub. GitHub. You can find it in, uh, let's see here, fast. Drop this in here. I should probably figure out how to make it so that you can just say like, you know, dash code or something like that. Um, and then everything that you want to look at is in here. And this is the A star search solver. It turns out to be really simple. This is the whole, that's the whole thing right there. Yeah, how do I do that? How do you add that sort of a thing? Is that like Streamlabs or is it just something that I have to figure out how to set up in Twitch? Yeah, I don't really know. Uh, not Stream Elements. The only thing I have right now is Streamlabs. I'm more than happy to try it out though, Stream Elements. Stream Elements. Is this just something you sign up for? Oh, Tim! <laughs> okay. All right, I'll take a look at this uh, after the stream today, see if I can get this set up. I actually, uh, my green screen is coming tomorrow. I'm hoping it gets here before noon when I start so that I can have a, a for real green screen instead of this craziness where my fingers are all going, whatever. Go to your Streamlabs. Uh, yep, Streamlabs. Here it is. Alert box, event. This is this is what I'm using. I'm just looking at this. I also am using uh, Streamlabs OBS. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's the code. Uh, yeah, it, it turns like I said, it turns out to be pretty easy. Um, the the issue that I'm trying to, to work on right now is it is looking at 475,000 states, but we know that there's only 180,000 states. And the reason that this is happening is my my open set implementation is allowing the same state 
to be entered into the open set, which you know val invalidates the set property of each thing can only be in there once. And I just have to I just have to get it sorted out and figure out how to how to make it work. And so like if you go back and watch the video of this, like the first thirty minutes of this stream is just me going, I have no idea how to do this. I have no idea how to do this. But I came up with a a little idea to basically maintain uh, a dictionary and then a sorted dictionary one that is a map of the state to the cost and then the other that is um, of the cost to all of the states that have that cost and then the idea being that when you want to uh, when you want to remove something you go i'm sorry when you want to remove the min you go to the sorted dictionary and you grab the first one which is always the min and then you you pop it off and then you do you know just a bunch of maintenance to make sure that you're actually removing it from everywhere that it needs to be removed from. Uh, and then when you want to push something on, you're actually going to go look at the state to cost. So you'll look at this one and you'll say, okay, do I have it? And if I do, where can I find it in this other dictionary? And then when you go and look it up in this other dictionary. Um, and then you can you can either update the value or whatever it is that you got to do. But that's that's what I'm that's what I'm trying right now. So let's see. I say if it's empty, you can't pop from an empty. If then you go and you grab the first from the sorted one. Take the list of states. Grab any state from it because it doesn't matter which one we do. We're not worrying about it being stable here. To do worried about stability. Probably not. We'll just check that though. Um, and then what we say is, okay, go ahead and remove it because we are popping it out of here. So remove it from the dictionary of state to cost and then remove it from this hash set of items that have the same cost and then if the hash set is now empty then remove that from the sorted dictionary altogether so that takes care of popping now we want to worry about improving for improving what we want to say is uh, does it exist in here at all so if uh, if state cost dot contains key of state. All right, so if it's in here, then we need to worry about improving it. All right, if cost is less than, and let's put an else. I don't know. All right, if if the new cost is less than the existing cost, state cost of state. Why is why is that giving me hell? Cannot. Oh, oh, oh. oh. That compare to state.cost is less than zero, then what we need to do is update it by moving it. All right, move it. Oh man, come on. And then we want to return. And then we want to say if it's not part of the state cost, uh, then we just want to add it. So we just say state cost dot add of state cost. And then we say if, if state, if cost states dot contains key of cost then we want to just add it then we want 
and we say cost states of cost dot add state and if it doesn't then we need to create a new one then we say cost uh, bar items equal cost states of no bar items equal new hash set uh, cost t cost no t state items dot add state and then we want uh, items then we want uh, cost states dot add of cost and items and call this states okay so in the case that um, we did not have in the case that we did not have the state already, then we add the state to the state cost, and then we add it to the cost states in one way or another. In the case that we do already have it and it's an improvement, we need to move You know what, we're gonna do this twice. Private void uh, improve state or just push T cost, T value, T cost, cost, and value. Why are you complaining? State. So with Streamlabs, there is a client you need to download and you can do it in there. Oh, I do have that client, I believe. Uh, let's see here. Timestamps, manage moderation settings. Low mode, edit appearance. Mm. Yeah, I... I'm gonna have to take a look at this later. There's like no way I'm gonna get this done right now. I can't post links. Oh, that's pretty lame. I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, settings. Tweeted it to you. Okay, great. There we go. Oh, chat bot. Ah, got it. Okay, let's see here. Just tell me what these things are. Don't make me guess, please. Credits. Nope. Oh, chat bot. Don't forget to mod chatbot by typing slash mod streamlabs all right you can fix the link issue in twitch i'm in twitch 
timestamps, readable colors, slow mode, mod icon, raids, change moderation settings. Yeah. Block hyperlinks. No thanks. There we go. How about that? Try it now. I lost all my chat because I switched off of it. Okay, I think I fixed the link situation for chat. Oh. Hey, all right, perfect. Streamlabs.chatbot, that's awesome. Okay, so I turned on the chatbot. Now I just add a command, a custom command, add command, enter command, the string for which do I want it to be GitHub? Yeah, sure, let's do GitHub. So it's funny, I actually am seeing the links that you're posting, but in my stream chat, it looks like they're being deleted. So that, oh no, they're showing up. That's cool. Okay, uh, so let's add a command, GitHub. And I want this to basically return the URL to the GitHub page. Fast. Permission, everyone, reply in chat, save. Did that work? Oh wait, slash mod streamlabs. I think that should have done that. Streamlabs is already a moderator. Okay, great. Now let's try this. <gasps> That's awesome. That just made my day. Oh man, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Dude, thanks for that. That is that is so much help. Now I have like 50 things I'm probably going to want to put in there. I'm going to get myself tied to Streamlabs, I can tell. I should probably get off it sooner than later. Or I'm going to get to this point where like it's going to take me like a week to fix everything on whatever new system I end up on. Uh, well, hello to uh, whoever else stopped by, and uh, appreciate you coming and hanging out. Drop a line in the chat. It's cool to just watch, too. Um, let's see here. we got about 30 minutes left. Uh, I want to... You're using streaming elements. Okay, I'm going to definitely check that out. I think I'm going to get through this weekend. Yeah, like, to be honest with you, I haven't started, like, announcing that I'm doing... Um, I haven't, I haven't started announcing like on Twitter or anything when I'm streaming yet because I'm really trying to get all the kinks worked out and like get comfortable sitting in front of the lights uh, and get all of my like, you know, just get comfortable with all of the things that I have to do and like turning my head and looking and reading and talking uh, in addition to like coding and getting used to just everything. How long have you been streaming for? <laughs> well, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh since december okay so you've got like what a month and a half or two months full under you how long did it take you to get comfortable with it and whatnot started over the holidays okay so about a month and a half god time's going by so fast You've done eight streams, okay. So you're just doing once a week on the weekends, or are you doing like twice on the weekends? I guess you gotta be doing more than that, or maybe you did a lot during the holidays and then once a week since then? Seven days. I was just thinking about like the little, uh, what you columns that they have, the like achievements that you get for for streaming and it's like yes you've streamed on seven different days 
don't really feel comfortable. Yeah, I'm feeling that. I totally understand that. I probably should just start announcing it because it's not going to get better once people start showing up. It's going to be like starting it all over again. <laughs> so maybe I will start doing that a little bit more. I also wanted to get like far enough into the project where I'm not doing what I consider to be boring things, but I'm actually focusing on like the actual AI part of doing AI. I think... So I guess, yeah, to fill you in, like the long-term goal, you'll notice that the other project in here is fast.bloss. That's basic linear algebra sub subroutines. And the idea here is I want to make, I want to make a faster, well, I started off by wanting to make a uh, matrix multiplication on a computer in .NET as fast as it is in other languages. Why is this not working? T oh, it's T-state. Have problems when I see red, little red squigglies. Um, yeah, so there's matrix multiplication. And if you do matrix multiplication in Python, it's like ridiculously fast, right? At least using NumPy. So if we do like Python, uh, import numpy as np and then we say like a equals np dot random dot rand of I don't know a thousand by a thousand oh I guess it's without these okay yeah so if we just do like a and then we do b the same way b if I can learn how to type you have a you have B, notice they're not the same. And then what you do, I thought that you had done lots of performance, perf improvements in .NET Core. I do, I do lots of them, but uh, let me just let me just finish going over like the, the whole idea here, uh, which is if you take NP dot, literally dot, and then A and B, like that happens ridiculously fast. It just multiplied these two things, dense matrix multiplication, extremely fast. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They have, but like they don't have. There is no math library per se in in .NET that's like blessed by Microsoft and run by Microsoft. And in fact, I don't really think in any language there is because it's not really like the point of the language. Maybe there is in Python, not Python. Maybe there is in. Uh, it starts with an F. Fortran. Maybe there is in Fortran because uh, like that's what the language was about. And maybe there is in like MATLAB as well, because again, that's what the language is about. Uh, but I know like in R and all these other ones, what they do is they just write wrappers for Intel MKL library, um, which is like the library for doing linear algebra that was built by the people who build the processor. Right. And I'm like, that's fast and I want to see how fast we can do it in .NET. And so if you if you do like a time it on this, this ends up taking like, I don't know, like eight milliseconds or something to do a 1000 by 1000 times a 1000 by 1000. And when I do it in .NET uh, using my little implementation, which I guess I can just show to you because I can, I'm right here. So what is this Python going to be so fast? Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so, and funny enough, yes, you can, yes, you can write a wrapper in C sharp for MKL. And like, that is, that is my intention. There is some overhead because you have to convert the data structure, uh, from being uh, in a managed world to being in an unmanaged world. Um, but once you get done with that, then, you know, that part happens fast and then you have to do the conversion back to the managed world. So you pay a little bit of overhead, but it's still really, really fast. Um, and what I wanted to do, uh, I started off by like showing how to make matrix, uh, to make matrix multiplication a little bit faster in .NET, which I'll just give you an example of here. Oh crap, where, where am I typing? Okay, cd fast dot blas, and then if we just say .NET run, I need to move this over to a unit test as well. What you end up with is this thing that's like, okay, here it's running it in a bunch of different ways. So first it runs like a naive implementation and then it runs a naive using my own little like wrapper class for a matrix, which is really, really bad. And then it does a little bit of different. And then we move into a unsafe world, uh, which basically gets rid of a lot of bounds checkings 
bounds checks on arrays and you can see that that actually eats up quite a bit of time and then we do a bunch of other stuff we get down here we um, transpose it and you can see that transposing it uh, vastly improves the speed at which you can you can do this at um, and then we do striding and these numbers right here are not accurate because I am running a stream at the moment and when I stop running a stream and I run it in release mode you'll see that all of these numbers end up being enormously faster although because i'm streaming it's not going to work out like that yeah anyway one when, when my computer is not like grinding through video this happens much 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 faster and on my laptop it happens much 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 faster you should try it on your own and what you'll see is there's like all of these different implementations of how to do matrix multiplication um and these ones down here at the bottom all right, see, when you get to the striding, you can tell now that the striding is like very, very close to this. And as the size of your matrix gets larger and larger, this becomes enormously better than this. But the idea is really, um, I'm writing a book about like how to do entry level performance optimization. Um, and one of the main like use cases in this, or not use cases, but one of the, the main examples that I give is this idea of improving the speed of matrix multiplication um, and it turns out that the, there's just like a lot of little tricks and when you learn them they tend to be very applicable across a lot of different domains um, so take a look through here if you have any questions feel free to ask me um, and then you can basically just see that like there's a bunch of different implementations and you get to these like right here these striding so then i had this grand idea in my head and i was like what if we just wrote some code that would figure out the best way to do matrix multiplication. And I was like, I am actually pretty good at doing like large state space searching. So why don't we just frame this whole problem as a search problem and we'll write all the search stuff and then we will figure out the optimal way to write a matrix multiplication in .NET. And like, that's the grand scheme here. Um, and I don't know if it's even gonna be possible, but it's like, why not give it a shot? I've got all this time. <laughs> and if we could do it, you know, there's a pretty large implications around there around like, you know, getting a lot of stuff to be faster. If you could replace the MKL or the open blos library with a faster way of doing it, you would help, you know, a very large amount of software running in the world, which would be pretty awesome. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's what it is. It's a search problem, right? You, you start at none of the operations that you need to accomplish have been done. You do an operation and then you guess how, how many more operations you have to do uh, in terms of time. Also keep in mind that operations on a processor don't take the same amount of time. Multiplying two numbers takes longer than adding two numbers. Uh, so the cost difference of each additional step is, is not the same. Um, and basically, yeah, it's just, you make a thing, you add the cost, you predict how much you have left. That's the whole thing. And all we have to do is come up with a good heuristic. And this same implementation that we're going to use for the end puzzle should work for matrix multiplication. And that's the idea. Uh, don't say it like that. This is just like, <laughs> you know, I'm good at the things that I'm good at. And I am very awful at the things that I am very awful at. I'm, I'm, I am taking a class right now on, uh, I'm, I'm in grad school, by the way, at uh, Georgia Tech doing their online program. And I am taking a class this semester on computer networking. And it's like this whole new world to me. Like I have been a web developer like for 10 years professionally and like hobbyist well before that. And I am just now starting to really learn like how the internet actually works. And it's just like, it's been really, really mind blowing. And like, it's just incredible how simple it is. And it's incredible how complicated it is at the same time. <laughs> but yeah, it's just one of those things. I'm, I'm good at the things that I'm good at and I'm very bad at the things that I'm not good at. And uh, yeah, TCP IP routers. Yeah, okay, so yeah, I gave this, we had some interns very recently and I gave them a talk it's like normally when people talk about like how the internet works, they always start at like, okay, we have this whole internet and now let's break it down piece by piece. And instead I took this other direction of like, okay, 
we want to have two computers talk to each other. How do we do that? And then, you know, it's like, okay, you just plug a wire in between these two things. And now you need all of you. I mean, you already need like communication protocols just for these two computers to talk to each other. And then what happens if you add a third computer? And then what happens if you have 10 computers sitting in a room? You don't really want 10 computers connected to 10 computers. That's not super efficient. And that's a lot of wires running all over the place. So what do we do instead? Right now we have a switch or a hub, I guess they had back then, but now we have a switch and it's like, okay, now this switch needs to know where these other things are and that's MAC addresses. And then now we have these two networks that want to talk to each other. How does that happen? Now we have to move up one more layer. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Just tons and tons of layers and it's all been like added on top of each other. And I think it makes for a little bit easier to digest way of thinking about it than like, here's this great big internet and let's learn like, you know, the very first thing that happens, it's, it's much easier to think of in small bits that add up to something large, at least for me, than something large made up of small things. I feel like a lot of things we know the large and we don't know the small. And so that like building block step way of thinking about things isn't super easy. Like for instance, uh, you know, cells that make up the body and like what makes up the cells and then what makes up that crap and then what makes up that crap, you know, all of physics, basically, we, we see the large uh, effects of things happening. And then we have to like sort of break it down and see how the smaller parts interact. And that's, that's a totally different thing. But if you have the option to start with something small and see how it turned into something big, man, it's for me, that's just so much easier to digest. But anyway, um, yeah, so, so again, that's like, that's the whole goal. And right now I am trying to finish implementing a fix for this open set so that it doesn't allow the same item to be inserted more than once. And then we should get very, very, very comparable numbers when we run those tests that I showed earlier, uh, to see if, to see, uh, to see if we're actually making the progress that we want. And then I will go ahead and uh, after that, I think I'll go ahead and calculate a perfect heuristic for this really simple problem by literally just calculating the value of all states and then creating a giant array and just doing a lookup every time you wanna make a move um, to, to just show you that there is no work to be done or, or there is only work on the optimal path when you have a perfect heuristic and that's why we wanna get there. It turns out though that having something that's like 50% of the way there will get rid of like 90% of the work or even 99% of the work depending on how big it is. Uh, so really any improvement that you can make, you don't have to get to an optimal solution. And it turns out even for like the four by four that has 10 trillion states that getting a solution to only one corner of the board gets it to the point where you can solve those problems trivially in a few milliseconds. Um, so I'd like to implement that because the implementation of that is something that is quite interesting um, and captures a, a lot of the nuance of the bigger problem that I'm after. And then, and then yeah, I think uh, we'll start, you know, working on the matrix multiplication problem. Maybe we'll start small with matrix multiplication and do like a 10 by 10 or something see if we can do it but basically the fun part there is you have to you have to build a world and then you have to implement the rules of the world and all of that stuff right now lives in in puzzle let's go ahead and close this up so i can actually see what i'm looking for don't care about test in puzzle and the idea is you have a couple of things which is you want to be able to tell whether you want to expand all of the possible moves shuffle isn't actually used so we can get rid of that uh you want to I don't actually care about any of this either because that was just used for shuffle. Getting rid of code, deleting code is so much fun. Um, yeah, all you want to do is you want to be able to expand all of the possible actions. Uh, then you want to be able to update your state by taking an action. And then you want to, there's one more thing. You want to be able to check whether or not it's a goal. And those are the three things that you need to do uh, those are like the three rules of the game of the world, so to speak, that you need to implement in order for a star to work. And that's it. It doesn't matter what your world is. It could be playing any video game in the world. It could be doing, you know, finding directions in a very large graph. It could be whatever. The idea is that you just want to give it 
an implementation for those three features and then that's that's it and it can do the rest on its own wow okay back to this uh, so this was push of cost and state and then I want to say right here what we want to do. So I think you need to read up about AI in my head. Oh, you need to read up. <laughs> I read that as if you were telling me to. Uh, no, 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 it absolutely does not need to be lots of computers. And in fact, um, that is one of the things that is like the most untrue. Uh, AI that requires a lot of computers is not particularly valuable. Because one, it costs an incredible amount of money in order to run all of that, those those resources. And then two is like, if you have to, there's there's like network overhead for making calls out to all your different computers and whatnot. And uh, generally, when we talk about AI, you want things that are like the speed of a normal human interaction. So real time kind of a stuff. If I ask for directions, I want the directions very, very quickly. I don't want to like send an email to a place and about an hour later it tells me what the directions are i want to go to google i want to say how do i get from roanoke to i don't know washington dc and it just boom there's my like 20 20 turns that i need to take to get from my house to the doorstep that i want to get to um and if it's not fast i go somewhere else and the same thing with like image recognition and stuff like that when you get into like deep learning it still has to be fast the training part of it is extremely slow because you need a lot of input data you know think about a human we've been using our eyes recording what 30 frames a second for our entire lives and like our brain has been learning from all of this constantly for i guess for me for 35 years for 36 how old am i 36 i think i'm 36 for 36 years, it's been getting 20 frames, 20 or 30 frames a second, constantly, 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 right? When we try to train a neural network, it has nothing there. And we're trying to train it all at once. I mean, it takes an enormous amount of data and an enormous amount of, of time to like replicate what I have been doing my entire life. Um, so a large part of, oh, so I think I need to, so our sat navs like TomTom, Tom, for example, doing route map locally. Uh, I don't know the answer for that. I want to say the Garmin's that they used to have prior to like everybody just using, you know, Google on your cell phone. Um, the Garmin's would actually send a request out to a server and then that server would do the processing and then it would send it back. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me. You can fit the entire model to do directions like on one of those things. And then additionally, you can you can really sort of narrow down the scope of the problem um, because instead of doing the whole, you know, uh, a graph of all the roads in the whole world, you can say, just give me the things that are within, I don't know, 100 miles of me or just give me the highways. Um, don't worry about the intersections of every little like nook and town and cranny and whatever. Um, and then as I get closer to there, you know, as I am driving from here to New York, when I get to, I don't know, one of those places outside of New York, you know, then it can go and grab just the area and run a search for just around New York because they had no data connection. Well, then I guess they were doing it on, on their own. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, no, I love this stuff. And in fact, uh, I think after this, after after I get done with this eight puzzle thing, I am going to do um, like a, a routing example where we take like a, a graph of the entire United States or maybe, you know, all of the UK and come up with graphs on that or, or come up with driving directions from that. Uh, because what you can do is you can write a little plug in where you just make a little request, you know, via your your little grease monkey script back to your own server, and then it comes and tells you the directions. And you can also put in all of the places that it searched right on a Google map by just drawing on the Google map. And you can see the different like expansions like on the map. And that's super fun. Like that's super, super fun. 
anything anything that is graphics and shows you how things work is so much better than like explaining it for an hour. But yeah, yeah, I uh, I'm actually in grad school. I, like I like I mentioned earlier, I'm I'm doing machine learning as like a concentration, and this computer networking class is my last class, and I can't wait to be done with it so that I can have a lot more time to do all of this kind of stuff instead of doing homework <laughs> because I'm tired of doing homework. Um, anyway, uh, welcome everybody else who has joined. Uh, please drop a line in chat, say hi. If you want to just hang out, that's totally cool too. Um, kind of wrapping up here. I'm going to see if I can get done with this last little thing that I was trying to get done today. And if I can get done with this, then I think we'll basically take a look at it, start checking everything in and, uh, and wrap up here. All right. Get my brain back on here. So push or improve. Push or improve. Uh, we first see if the thing is in our set at all. If it is in our set, then we check the cost. If the cost... No, if the cost is... Is greater than or equal to zero, then we can just return. Because in that case, we don't actually want to do anything. All right, in the case that it is an improvement, we need to fix it. So state cost of state equals cost. And then we need to remove the existing one. And then we need to remove the existing one. How do we do that? How do we remove the existing one? We go to cost states and we look for the cost. And then we say dot remove of state. And we're just going to boldly make the assumption that we have maintained the state correctly and that we don't need to error check this. Solid indication, indication of a problem if this fails. And then we have removed it. We have updated the cost. Actually, I don't even need to update the cost because this next one is going to update it. State, oh yeah, because we did add. So we can get around that by just, I really want to do it like that. No, I don't. I want to change it. State cost equals cost. So if you call dot add on something that already is in there, it will fail. If you just index it and set it to a value, then it succeeds no matter what. Um, so calling dot add is safe when you want it to fail. Uh, in this case, I am maybe, maybe, maybe we're just gonna change this actually and just not do this here at all. Maybe we're gonna just do an else and then we're gonna say the dot add. Cause I, I do, if, if I have screwed up, I want to be notified is really the reason for like keeping this like this. And then because we only called push once, I can move this back up here. And then we can get rid of this. Okay, now let's just walk through this one more time. So we have a state cost. If, if we already have the state, in our set, then what we want to do is say, we only want to change anything if it's an improvement. So if the cost, the new cost, is greater than the old cost, greater than or equal to the existing cost, then we don't need to do anything and we just bail. Otherwise, we know it's an improvement, so we update the cost, and then we go to this, the other set, the sorted set and we remove the state then 
we come down here and we add in the state to the new place that it belongs. And this takes care of creating the hash set if we need to create the hash set or not. Uh, in the case that this is that we do not already have the state, then we just go straight to the state cost, add it, and then we also add it into the, so I'll just say, uh, add the state to the cost states. All right. Okay, that's uh, just gonna give this a shot, really. So open set one, call that open set, call that open set one. Open, um, you know what, let's go open set new. And then open set. And then let's go to the test or open set, and then I wanna say open set new, and open set new. All right, so this test is basically pushing a bunch of values, 10, 20, 30, and then we are pushing other ones that do not improve the score, so that it should just be no ops, and what we should see is that because we're only adding the same values in, I'm sorry, the yeah, the same states in, that the final size should only be three because it should not be replacing these, it should just be bailing. And this was failing on the previous implementation. I'm really crossing my fingers here. <gasps> it passed! I love coding. I love coding when things work. <laughs> Next one. Uh, this one is Instead of inserting them in this awesome crazy order, this one is we are going to do the same thing but with more states. So the problem that we saw in the previous one is that it's building this binary tree and then it has to look for where to put them. Oh, you know what else we need to do? We need to like, we need to make sure. Well, no, I got the size as three, so that's correct. So we're just gonna roll with that actually. Ah, uh, thanks, man. Man, actually, that that makes my day because, like, I've had some, I've had some struggle bus times <laughs> trying to get it right. The very first one I did, I had my mic off for the first hour and fifteen minutes, <laughs> and then uh, another one that I did, I accidentally popped some stuff on my screen from work that I should not have popped up here. Yeah, I mean, just like, and this is again, I was just these things that I have to just get worked, work, work the kinks out in order to get them right. Let's go ahead and save this before I forget about it. Fast, I don't want a PDN, I want a BMP. No, I want a PNG. There we go. Flatten, sure, whatever. Don't care about that one. Um, okay, so that one worked, now let's try the bigger one. And then I wanna try another one where we improve stuff. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, now the other test that will tell us pretty boldly whether or not it's succeeding or not is running the solver, which we need to change the actual open set now. Uh, open, set, open set old, open set old. I'm hoping to remove this one in just a second. That's why I'm naming it like this. Open set, open set. I just pressed it, just press build like it was gonna actually do something. That's hilarious. Okay, open set test. Uh, open set, open set, this is what I want. Open set, uh, and then I wanna go ahead and add one more test. which is, uh, no, you know what, I already have a test for this. Which is this one. 
adds a bunch of values to it twice, then s make sure that I get them out in the correct order. And it passed. Okay, so now I wanna run the solver test and I wanna just make sure that these are running and these, if we'll know whether or not this was correct based on whether or not it explored more nodes than there are states. And it didn't, yay. All right, test breadth first search and we see that we got 181. And guess what? If we go to, if we go to nine factorial, factorial divided by two, 181, 440. See, we explored every single possible node because this is the goal that is the absolute furthest away. So we had to try every single possible other state that is reachable before we reach the goal, which is the absolute furthest away. So this makes perfect sense that it was off by one. And now when we run the other ones, we should actually see what we're looking for, which is that as you start using heuristics, your solutions get enormously better. So this one's the Hamming distance. And again, the Hamming distance is a really, really, really like rudimentary and simple um, heuristic. And you can see that it makes an improvement but not that much of an improvement. And then when we get to the Manhattan distance, this one is just going to be like almost, almost nothing. Perfect. Number of evals, 7,000. Yeah, this is, this is exactly what we were hoping for. All right. That's great. That's really great. So I feel good about that. Yeah, it's uh, I, it's not a real green screen, and uh, I'm using like a like a little app that basically picks out the background and gets rid of it called Chroma Cam, and then it's I mean it's it's a very it's really crappy software, frankly, and I'm not gonna pay for it. And because I'm not paying for it, it's uh, it's like oh, we're just gonna advertise on top of your video for you. <laughs> But yeah, that'll like I said, that'll all be gone tomorrow, hopefully, because my green screen gets here tomorrow. I hope it gets here before I stream at noon, noon local time. And then that's it. Um, but yeah, so I'm actually going to wrap this up. If uh, anybody has anything you want to talk about, totally happy to just spend a little time chatting. But for now, I think I'm going to I'm going to stop the code here and get this all checked in. Which green screen? Great question. Let's go take a look. Amazon. This is one of those places where I should uh, see your orders. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. That is exactly what I want to do. Here it is. This one. Right there. And then I got like a stand for it as well. I got this stand that comes with it. So that's the one. Yeah, I didn't want to go crazy. I have a very small office. I should actually, you know what, let's just do this. Uh, how do I go to my video? How do I go to full screen? How do I go to my camera? Settings? Properties? Chroma cam? Yeah. There we go. All right, so this is my office. I have a giant whiteboard over here um, and I have a door. And because of that, I don't really have like any place, you know, back here to put a, a permanent green screen because my intention is to eventually start using this whiteboard as part of the stream. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and I have, uh, yeah, like I'm one of those people where like I keep a giant stack of paper like on my desk for for writing down basically everything to work through the details before I start writing code. Um, but whenever I'm like on a hangout with people from work, it's always up here on the whiteboard because they can't see me writing on my desk. And so instead, I'll just grab one of the markers and start going. And I actually have a camera right here, which is not plugged in at the moment because this Another another problem with this chroma cam thing is it creates like a virtual camera and then it tries to just randomly take over one of your cameras. 
Also, why did this shrink? Properties. Oh no, I don't want that to be my resolution. I want that to be my resolution. Is that what I want? Done. Oh, it's crapping out. Nope, there it goes. Full screen video. I really want to know why this isn't going to my preferred resolution. And also why it's coming up with like really awkward resolutions. How about we just do that one? I don't know what to say here. This is really weird. It used to be just fine. It used to be just full screen. I don't know. Anyway. Oh, great. Well, I've broken my stream. Guess we're going to have to fix that later. Uh, front camera. Nope. Let's go back to chroma cam. Does that work? Ooh. Hey, all right, I fixed it. Yay. No, it's okay. It's all stuff I need to get sorted out, figure out how to work. <laughs> anyway, yep, that's it. That's what I got. And uh, yeah, I do, I wanna use the whiteboard and I want to, I just wanna get everything set up in the way that I'm, I'm comfortable with it. But yeah. All right, well, thanks for hanging out, man. Uh, I guess I will see y'all tomorrow. And uh, I'll be looking out for y'all streams in the evenings. Um, you know, most evenings I, I do. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks again, man. Like, you really made my day by saying that. You have no idea. Like, this, like, sitting down and, like, talking for hours straight with very little interaction has been quite difficult. So having somebody drop by and, like, feel like I'm actually you know, sharing some, some nice content, some, some valuable content is really helping my like motivation level to continue. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and close down and, uh, I guess I'll see you in someone else's stream later. So y'all have fun.